Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? We're going to the ninth division of Mark's gospel today. Mark chapter 9 is where we will spend virtually all of our time. And so we'll ask you to open your Bible there and be ready to read with us in just a moment. We're going to read several verses today that will not be on the screen. And so it's very important that you open a Bible and be ready to read with us there. And also, you should have a family report on the backside of that as an area designed to jot a couple of notes, and that will help you as we try to make our way through this material today as well. If you're visiting with our church family today, and there are several in that category, as there always are, we welcome you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being a part of our assembly. And those of you who are watching via live stream, we express the same to you. Thank you for being with us as well. And joining us, whether from Tampa Bay or some other part of the United States, thank you for being a part of our assembly this morning. It's wonderful to see all of you and glad that we can be together for a few minutes today. Appreciate Jay's good prayer a moment ago and Brad's good song direction and Matt's excellent communion meditation and glad we can study the Bible for just a little bit, a little bit today. My wife Vicki and I are great fans of Downton Abbey. We have enjoyed every episode of all six seasons. <clears throat> we enjoyed all of that, and then we watched the movie last year. We actually watched it more than once, and we are looking forward to the movie that's going to come out again this December. We like Downton Abbey. This was immensely popular in the United States. There's a fascination, it seems, with British aristocracy and all that went along with that. These large and stately mansions, the stately dinners, the elegant dresses, the beautiful settings, and then the servants. The servants that were everywhere to cater to the whim of those who were their masters. Now, that is something that is foreign to us in these United States. But in Downton Abbey, there are two stories. There are two stories of two particular groups of people, and they are radically diverse. They are completely different. There are the upstairs people on Downton Abbey, and these are the Crawleys. The Crawleys have inherited wealth and prosperity, the mansion, everything that goes along with that. They are the individuals who are the upstairs people. And the other story <clears throat> surrounds those who are the downstairs people, and they are the servants, and they are everywhere. They serve the family that is upstairs. They are butlers and under butlers, and they are cooks and footmen and ballots and uh, chauffeurs and maids that were everywhere. And they exist. They work long hours and hard hours, and they just exist to serve the family that's upstairs. Now, they don't dress like the upstairs family. They don't eat like the upstairs family. They certainly do not have the privileges of the upstairs family. They are two very diverse, different worlds in one house. Now, most individuals who watch this show, particularly in America, we would look at those two, the upstairs and the downstairs people, and we'd say, well, you know what, I think I'd like to be the upstairs folks. I would like to be one of the Crawleys, because after all, the Crawleys have all the servants serving them. What would that be like? What would it be like to have somebody cook for you and clean for you and just do everything in the world for you? But the reality, of course, is that most of us who have watched that show, if we were in that setting, we would not be the upstairs people. We'd be the downstairs folks. We would be the ones who were doing the serving, and we'd have some way that we are some role that we would fulfill in serving those folks upstairs. Now, Jesus was definitely an upstairs person. I mean, he lived. He lived in the very glory of heaven, and so he was the ultimate upstairs person. What is amazing is. That Jesus came to this world, according to Philippians 2, and he became, he became a downstairs person, one who was there to serve. And that brings us this morning to our reading of Mark chapter 9. Do you have your Bible this morning? These verses will <clears throat> not be on the screen, so it's really important that you read together with me. In Mark chapter 9, let's begin in verse 33. They, that is Jesus and the apostles, came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the road they had argued about who was going to be the greatest. Well, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Then he took him in his arms and he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children of my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me does not only welcome me but the one who sent me 
Now, we've read that together, but really, that little section is predicated on some things that just happened before. Now, this whole section really begins, it has its, its roots in the soil of the transfiguration, and Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and he performs just an amazing miracle of a young man who has been demon-possessed. <clears throat> and will you flow all the way out of that? I want you to read with me, beginning in verse 30, because here's the background that led him to all of that teaching about servanthood. So in verse 30, they left that place and they passed through Galilee and Jesus did not want any to know that they were there because he was teaching his disciples. And he said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But the disciples did not understand what he meant. And they were afraid to ask him about that. Well, I want to explore that just a little bit with you, but I want you to look at verse 31 because verse 31 really is the key to this. It's the hinge, I think, for much of the passage where because he was teaching his disciples, he said, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, he will ultimately die, and he will ultimately rise. But there are two words in verse 31 that are extremely important for our consideration this morning. The first is the word teaching. Everywhere in the Gospels, you read about Jesus teaching. You can't turn a page in the Gospel without reading Jesus was teaching, either the crowd or the multitude or his apostles or the disciples. He is always teaching because Christianity is a thinking person's religion. Jesus never once said, look, all I really care about is that you go to worship and you get the feels, you have some emotion about that, and as long as that happens, we're good. He never said that. Christianity is designed to be a thinking individual's faith. And so he is forever teaching. And in this case, he is teaching his disciples, that is, his followers. Now, this is important, ladies and gentlemen, because here, at least, he's not teaching the crowd. He's not teaching the multitude. He's not teaching the groupies. He's not teaching the hangers-on. He's talking to his genuine disciples. And disciples, of course, are followers. And what he is about to teach his followers is going to separate the men from the boys. It's going to separate those who are just pretenders from those who are truly committed to him. And so, to his disciples, he teaches and says, the Son of Man, he would say, that's me, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men. The parallel accounts say the hands of sinful men. They will kill me, and after three days, he says, I will rise. And please understand, ladies and gentlemen, what Jesus has just said. He just said, look, whatever you may have thought, I'm not coming to set up a dominant world power. I am not coming, he says, to liberate Israel from Roman occupation. I am not coming to validate in 2021 your particular political party. I am not come, he said, in 2021 to make you healthy and wealthy. He said, let's be really clear here. I am come to die. I have come to be delivered in the hands of men. I have come to die. I have come to sacrifice. I have come to serve. Now, that was not the kind of Messiah that they wanted. We ought to be real clear about that. That is not the kind of Messiah they wanted. But Jesus said, that's the kind of Messiah you're going to have. Just like today, he is often sometimes not the Messiah we may want. And yet he says, this is the only kind of Messiah that I am. Sometimes we look at Messiah and say, you know what, I expect you to take pretty good care of me. I go to church, I pray prayers, I serve, I try to do for others, and so I expect you to take pretty good care of me. And Jesus said, that's not my first job. In fact, look at what this says. They did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Let me tell you what I think the interpretation of that is. I think what, the, <clears throat> what that means is they didn't understand because they didn't want to understand because of what they did understand. You know what I'm saying by that? They didn't understand because they didn't want to understand and they didn't want to understand because of what they did understand. So let me just tell you what they understood. <clears throat> they understood a couple of things here really clearly. Number one, they understood that followers follow a leader. Now, that's not deep or profound, but it's certainly true. Followers 
follow a leader. When I do leadership training with churches, sometimes they'll say, how would you define a leader? I define a leader as somebody who has followers. If you don't have any followers, you're not really a leader. You may have a title, you may have an office, but if nobody's following you, you're not really a leader. Followers follow a leader. And what's really important about that is, you know that you're a genuine follower if you arrive where your leader arrives. And so you know that you're a real genuine follower if you end up where your leader ends up. So if I'm following someone on I-75 and they're in one car and I'm in another car and I'm following them, if they go all the way to the airport, they end up at the airport. <clears throat> if I'm truly following them, where am I going to end up? Well, I'm going to end up at the airport. But if we're driving down I-275 and they peel off on Del Mabry and I continue going south, I'm not following them anymore. Now, somebody may say to me, they may call and say, hey, Don, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm, I'm following somebody here on the interstate. Really, where are they? Well, I don't really know. They peeled off back behind me somewhere. I'm not following them anymore. Jesus is teaching his disciples, his followers. And he says to his followers, I am going to die. They understand that if they are his followers, then they're probably going to end up where he ends up. And so they don't understand what he's saying. And they're afraid to ask because they understand enough about being a follower to know that this may well not work out too well for them. And so Jesus says, look, here's where I'm going. Service, sacrifice, death. Any questions? No questions, Lord. Because they don't want to understand that real clearly. Look at Mark 8 and 34. He called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and look at that. Follow me. But a follower is going to end up the same place as the one who's leading. And so that, that's a tough statement. Look at verse 33 with me of, of, of Mark 9. They come to Capernaum. Capernaum. They come to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? It's like a dad and they, you've taken the minivan and the kids are all in the back and you get finally to the house and you want to ask them about something that you heard, but you didn't want to deal with it in the car. And so he says, hey, in the van, what were you guys arguing about? And they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was going to be greatest. Isn't that amazing? Jesus in one breath has said, look, I'm going to be taken from you and I'm going to die. And now they're arguing about who's going to be greatest. I take that to mean that they're arguing about who's going to be ordered from 1 to 11. Now we know who 12 is because Jesus has just called Peter Satan. If you're Satan, you're number 12. You're last. So they're arguing about who's going to be number 1 through 11. They don't want to answer him about that. But think about that. Think about what they're arguing about. In essence, they're saying, look, what's in this for me? What's religion going to do for me? When is religion going to pay off for me? God, do you have any idea how many prayers I pray? Do you have any idea all the things that I've done? When is this going to pay off for me? And that's what motivates Jesus in verse 35 to do this. Do you have your Bible? Let's read. Sitting down, <clears throat> Jesus called the 12. And he said, look, anyone who wants to be first, you're going to have to be the very last and servant of all. And then he took a little child and had him stand among them. And then he took the child in his arms and said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name <clears throat> welcomes me. Now I got to tell you, don't read that through Western eyes. Do not read that through American 21st century eyes. He took a little child had the child sit in the midst of it, then took him in his arms. When we read that through Western eyes, when we see a child, when we have a toddler, what do we do? For a child it, in our life, the whole world revolves around that child. That child is put on a pedestal. That child is adored. That child is revered. Everything in our lives revolves around our children. It was not that way in the first century world. In the greco roman world, <clears throat> children were not treated that way. 
They were not revered. They were not put on a pedestal. Handicapped children were routinely disposed of. Children were not the most important thing in somebody's house. They were at the very bottom of the social strata, only a level or two above a servant in the house. Children were there to be seen and not heard. And so when you, when you read that Jesus took a child and said, you're going to have to serve this child, we think, well, that's pretty easy. I serve my kids all the time. That's not the way it was in that world. They had no standing at all. And Jesus said, you want to be great? You're going to have to be willing to serve people who are like this child. You're going to have to be willing to serve the least. Somebody who, once you serve them, may not be able to do anything in return for you at all. You've got to be willing to serve somebody and understand that they are important, not because of what they have, not because of what they own or possess, but they are important simply because they are made <clears throat> in the image of God. In the nine o'clock hour, I asked the question, why is this story here? Now, if you're visiting with us this morning, <clears throat> I would say that oftentimes when I when I preach, especially in the Gospels, I ask that question. Why did the Holy Spirit record and preserve this story for us? Because at the end of John, in John chapter 20, John said, look, Jesus did so much. If we were to try to write all the things that Jesus did, the world would not be able to con contain the books. So why did the Holy Spirit decide, you know what? In 21st century America, in Temple Terrace, they need to hear this story. They need to learn this story. Why is this here? And I think the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is because of what was lost on page three of our Bibles. Because when you go back to Genesis chapter three, some very important things were lost. And so in Genesis chapter three, you have Adam and Eve. God is leading Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are following God. But the problem is that Adam and Eve decided to take an off ramp when God went ahead and went straight for a while. And so in Genesis 3, our adversary, the devil, slithered up next to Adam and Eve and said, you know what? You don't have to listen to God. You can go ahead and eat the fruit. In fact, I tell you what, the very instant that you eat the fruit, you are going to become God. You're going to be God. You will be exactly like God. You will take charge of your life. You will never have to hear Carrie Underwood sing, Jesus, take the wheel, because you, you will have the wheel of your life forever. You will be able to choose right and wrong. You'll be able to decide what is right and wrong for you. And so why serve God for the rest of your life when you can serve yourself? That's why from page three on, the remainder of the Bible is a story about a divine search and rescue mission because of what was lost in that story. So here's what was lost. In Genesis chapter three, mankind became the center of the universe. Not because God said, okay, you can be the center and circumference of everything, but because <clears throat> man appropriated that. We became the center of our universe. And so from Genesis 3, man has had the idea, you know what? I get to decide. I get to decide what I'll do with my sexuality and with whom I get to decide what I will do with my work and my money and my job. I will get to decide who I will be kind to. And whether or not I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat individuals of another race, another political party, or even another nationality, I'll decide whether or not I want to be nice to them and kind to them, or whether or not I'm going to denigrate them and demean them in some way or <clears throat> ignore them. I get to be the God of my life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I love the Bible. I love scripture. I love the word of God, especially those parts that agree with whatever I've decided about what I'm going to do with my life. That mindset, ladies and gentlemen, came from Genesis chapter three. Secondly, servant from Genesis three kind of became a dirty word. It became something that man now thought about and decided whether or not he was going to do. Because service from Genesis 3 means God said it clearly, you're not God. When God says, now I want you to serve, he's making it clear, you are not God. You may not get applauded. You may not get appreciated for what you do. You don't get to always be on the right hand or the left hand in the kingdom of God. It's not all about you. Now, there's some aspects of service that we really do extol. We extol, for example, servant leadership. I have a whole class that I teach with churches with 
elders, shepherds in churches on servant leadership. And we appreciate somebody that has a servant's heart and somebody that has a servant spirit. And those things are laudable. They are important. They are, they are worthy of being praised. Provided that we keep the perspective that we understand that while in those terms, servant is an adjective, in reality, servant, most importantly, is a noun. That it's much more about who we are than just what we do. And so that means, third, that serving has to be learned. Before Genesis 3, Adam and Eve understood. They understood who was God and who they were, and they understood they said to serve God. But after Genesis 3, Serving has to be learned. And so in our passage in Mark chapter 9, Jesus teaches an object lesson with a little child. He says this little child that has no standing whatsoever in society, that's not important in the eyes of society, you have to serve even little children. An even more dramatic object lesson was in John chapter 13 when they go into the upper room and the apostles are not about to lower themselves to do the work of a servant. And so Jesus does that. He gets up from the table, he girds himself, and he washes their feet. And then he says, do you understand what I've just done? And the answer to that question, by the way, was not, yes, Lord, you have washed our feet. That's not the point of that. The point of it is, I've served. And then he says, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, have served you, you ought to serve one another. This story is important. We need this story for three reasons. One is because we are uniquely created to do great things. God created us to do great things. I mean, let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 when God formed man to the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. From the very beginning, we were created by God for significance. We were created to have an impact and to have an influence in this world, to serve God and man in meaningful ways. I know that's true. The New Testament says that's true. We are God's handiwork. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so we were uniquely created to do great things by God. He never intended that we would exit this world having left no footprints in the snow that we had ever been there. And then secondly, service is where we discover our calling and our purpose and our Jesus. Let me define terms here for you. Serving is where we discover our calling. Let me talk about calling for just a minute. By calling, I mean that umbrella over my life that defines what I was created to do. It's the service that I offer to God and to others and this world that gives significance and impact and influence and meaning to my life. It's that umbrella for which I was created. But it's in service that I find my purpose. And purpose I would define as my job today. It's what's before me this week it's my tasks and my to-do list, and it's my resource and my experience that is to be used. And so what I mean by that is that your financial prosperity has a purpose. Your talent has a purpose. Your background has a purpose. Your baggage has a purpose. Your wounds that you've experienced have a purpose. Your gifts and abilities that God's given you have a purpose. Your personality has a purpose. And the purpose is that they were all designed by God <clears throat> for you to use to serve Christ and serve your family and your church family and, and your world. And then finally, we're never more Christ-like than when we're serving. So do you have your Bible? <clears throat> one more passage. I want you to turn one page to the right in your Bible and I want you to read with me in, in Mark chapter 10. And we don't have the time to, to look at the context, but, but coming out of the soil of chapter 9, what is developed are continual thoughts about service to the point that you get to chapter 10. And the mom of James and John comes to Jesus and says, could you do something for my boys? What would you like for me to do? Well, I'd like for them to sit on your right and left hand in the kingdom. 
And Jesus has something to say about that. And when he, when he finishes all of that, <clears throat> I want you to read with me, beginning in verse 42 of Mark 10. Jesus called them together. That would be his disciples, his apostles. And as an outgrowth of what's just happened with the mom of James and John, it says that the others were indignant. They were mad about this. Because you remember in chapter 9, they all wanted those positions, right? Right? So in verse 42, Jesus calls them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so, again, we are never more Christ-like than when we are serving. So, could I ask you something this morning, ladies and gentlemen? Have you found a place, a way to serve and be involved in the kingdom of God? Let's just start there. Have you found a place, a way to be involved in service in the kingdom of God? And the second question is, if not, why not? So four years ago, <clears throat> three years ago, I, I delivered a sermon based out of what we just read in Mark chapter 10. And I concluded that sermon by saying there is a place, there's a role for all of us. It doesn't matter who you are, what you perceive your weaknesses to be, or your strengths for that matter. There's a way for all of us to serve. And I ended that lesson by saying <clears throat> that everybody can serve. When you read your Bibles, you'll find that Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Joseph had been abused. Moses was slow of speech. Gideon was impoverished. Rahab was immoral. David had a terribly dysfunctional family. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Naomi was a widow. John the baptizer was eccentric. Peter was impulsive. Martha was a worrier. Zacchaeus was extremely unpopular with people. Thomas had doubts. Paul had very poor health. And Timothy was timid. What a collection, ladies and gentlemen. And yet God was able to use every single one of them. If it were Christmas time, all of them would have been found on the island of misfit toys. And God used every one of them. This church is full of servants. Some are young, <clears throat> some are old, but servants nonetheless. Some are women. In fact, this church could never function as effectively as it does without the hundreds of women in this church who make a difference for good in practical, tangible, helpful, meaningful ways that they have found to serve. Some of the servants in this church are men. Men who serve again in a thousand different ways. And many of those men, in fact, the majority of those men are men who will never serve in a capacity as an elder, a shepherd, or an overseer, or as a deacon. Now, that may be because of age or experience or some other circumstance in their life. But they're never going to serve in one of those two roles. And yet, they find ways, again, to meaningfully, tangibly, significantly, and practically serve. But those two roles, shepherds and deacons, of course, are extremely important. And so if you're a part of our church family, you know that <clears throat> just a few weeks ago, we appointed two additional men to serve 
as elders, shepherds, overseers in our church family. And today, it's our privilege to appoint nine additional men to serve as deacons in our congregation. Now, five of those men were appointed in our nine o'clock hour. There are four men to be appointed in this hour. I grew up hearing the cliche in our churches that the only thing that is worse than a congregation not having an elders and deacons is a congregation having elders and deacons who are either not qualified or competent to serve. There's a lot of truth in that. But we are very thankful that the men selected to serve as additional shepherds and the men appointed to the work of deacons today are both qualified and competent. So I'd like to ask the four men to be appointed in this service, if you would, to please make your way to the podium with me, if you would. I'm not sure I ever looked as young as these four men. <laughs> but these are four outstanding young men. I want to present them to you this morning. I want to appoint them to their work. We'll do that <clears throat> just in alphabetical order here. We'll begin with, with Tyler. Tyler Nerland. Now, Tyler has a recognizable last name in our church family, of course. Tyler came to us in the fall of 2011. He met Bethany. And in, 20, uh, in 2014, I believe, and they just celebrated this past week, your fifth anniversary. Is that correct? That's right. That's what I thought. They have two beautiful little girls. Uh, Adeline is three and Eloise is, is one. Tyler and Bethany left us for a time. They moved to North Florida, Tallahassee, and then to Jacksonville. But they've been back with us since 2018. Doug and Brenda are Tyler's aunt and uncle, Lauren and David Dvorak, Ashley and Bo Brantley. Those are all cousins to him. Tyler's an outstanding young man, entrepreneurial in spirit, hardworking always. So Tyler, I want to ask you today, <clears throat> do you willingly accept this work with a promise to faithfully serve the Lord in this church family? Do you promise to give your very best as you serve us as a deacon? I do. I know you will. I'm very proud of you, Tyler. Thank you. And Brandon Nichols is next. Brandon began worshiping with us at Temple Terrace in 2008. He and Hannah Mathis at that time were married in 2010. And Brandon and Hannah have, have from day one been a blessing to our church family. They have two handsome little boys, Conrad and Atticus, a law firm in the making if ever there was one. <laughs> Brandon <clears throat> is one of the most thoroughly pleasant people you will ever meet in this world. He and Hannah, though young, have touched countless lives, and I have no doubt will make a difference for good in this new role. And so, Brandon, I'm going to ask you today, do you willingly accept this work, and do you promise to faithfully serve the Lord in this church family, giving the very best that within you lies as you serve our congregation as a deacon? I do. Well, Brandon, I know you will, and I am delighted to point you to this work, and I know you'll be a blessing to us. Thank you. And Matt Richmond. Now, Matt is new to us, and yet Matt is not new to us, of course. Matt came to us in 2010 as an intern in our preaching training program. He and Laura were with us for a year, <clears throat> and now they returned. They returned just about six months ago in 2020. Matt came to us in 2010 as an intern in our preacher training program and was an extremely talented person as a gospel preacher. He is not preaching on a full time basis. But he is a great Bible student, as you saw during the communion meditation this morning. And Matt has always found countless ways to be involved in kingdom work. Matt brings a very specialized skill set to an area that is going to be of great value to us in our church family. Matt and Laura have four children. Quinn, who is age 10, Madeline, who is 9, Emery, who is 6, and Amelia, who is 3. And Matt's in-laws, Lee and Wendy, Quinn are with us now. They are new to us <clears throat> as well. There's an interesting symmetry in all of that. 
Uh, Lee and Wendy, of course, as I said, when they placed membership with us, I've known since 1978. We worshiped together in New Albany, Indiana, where I was preaching then. I held Matt's wife, Laura, in the hospital when she was born, along with her twin brother. And so this family has been special to me for a long time. And to appoint Matt today to this work is for me a particular pleasure because of the high regard that I hold Matt for the person that he is, the work that he does, and the great Christian that he is. And so, Matt, I will ask you, do you willingly accept this work with the promise to faithfully serve the Lord in this church family to the best of your ability as you serve us as a deacon? I do. I know you will. I'm really proud of you, Matt. Thank you, brother. And Brad, last, not least, just have a name that ends with an end, <laughs> uh, with an S. So, there we go. Brad came to us in 2009. And... He was with us for four years, then he returned in 2016. Brad, of course, as you saw this morning, is a talented song leader. Brad is also an excellent, excellent Bible class teacher, both for young people and for adults. I have no doubt that Brad is going to serve us well as a deacon. I've known Brad for a long time because Brad was a classmate and then a roommate with my son, Josh. I think both here and in yeah. Bowling Green, as I, as I recall correctly. And so I've known Brad and I've known his mom and his sisters at the Campbell Road Church in Dallas, where I've been many times in gospel meetings. Brad and Allison have been 12, married for 12 years. They have two beautiful little girls, of course, as you know, Madeline and Charlotte, ages seven and four. And they have a baby to be named later on the way this fall. And so we're very proud. Brad and Allison are, are part of a cadre of just outstanding young families who are making and will continue to make for years to come a difference for good in our church family. And we appreciate that so very much. So Brad, I'm going to ask you, do you willingly accept this word with the promise to faithfully serve the Lord in our church family? Do you promise to give the very best within you lies as you serve us yes. as a deacon? Yes, I will. I know you will, Brad. Mm -hmm. I'm really proud of you today. You. Appreciate it. God bless you in your work. Amen. I'm proud of these four young men. I'd like to ask the men in this audience who are currently serving us as deacons, if you would stand, please. If you're in this audience and you're one of our current deacons, would you stand? Thank you very much. Let's pray together. Our good Father, there are days that are so special to us. The Lord's Day is always special. But this day particularly so, because we are reminded how blessed we are that you have brought together in this place through your providence a group of men to serve both as shepherds and as deacons who help us all, not only as we serve in this place, but as together we are trying to navigate our way successfully from earth to heaven. And today, Father, we're particularly grateful for those men who serve us in this special capacity as deacons, for the work that they do, for the wonderful spirit which, which they bring to that, to that work, and for the difference for good that it makes. We thank you for these men and we thank you for their wives who stand by their side and who by virtue of the wonderful people that they are and the contribution that they make enable their husbands to serve in this special capacity. Today we thank you, Father. We praise you for every way that you bless our lives, but in particular for the ways that you have blessed this church family. Thank you so very much. We pray you today. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and amen. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you, thank you. What a good day. What a special day for our church family. We are so blessed in that through the years, we've had so many days like this. We've gone through this process of selecting additional shepherds and deacons, and we've done it so many times in our church family. It's always an exciting time. It's always a joyful time. It's always been for us a very peaceful and encouraging time. What an amazing blessing that is. In all of the lessons that we presented regarding shepherds and about deacons, we have always ended them in the same way. And that's with the observation that we all begin at the same place. We all begin at the same place. We all begin with the seed of faith being planted in our hearts and germinating, germinating to the point that we want to be obedient to God. 
And that all again begins for us in the same place, and that's in the waters of baptism. And so if you're in this audience this morning and you've made the resolution that today is going to be the day, today's the day that you're going to be baptized into Christ and to begin to walk in, what were the words of the New Testament? In newness of life, this invitation's for you. Let's stand and let's sing.